or you. <laughs> no. Anyways, thank you, uh, ladies. That was wonderful. Um, how many of you enjoy going to weddings? Yeah? Okay. How many of you like family reunions? Okay. Well, I'm excited because I have both of those events coming up in my family, my little sister, my not-so-little sister anymore. My younger sister, Ashley, is getting married on Easter Sunday, and so we're headed to Colorado this Friday um, to have a big family reunion before that. Uh, I have a brother, many of you know, I have a brother that lives in the Philippines. He's a missionary over there with his family. They're back in America on furlough. And then my other brother, Jared, and his family, they're, they're living in Lebanon. They're on their way back this upcoming week uh, to, to spend time with us for the wedding and, and family vacation. So anyways, we're looking forward to that. So I'll, I'll be missing you guys next Sabbath and the Sabbath after that, but I, I know that you guys are in good hands here. And so I'm, I, uh, uh, anyways, I'm grateful for the opportunity to go see family and uh, to be able to all get together. I can't wait for the great family reunion up in heaven. Amen. And I believe that that day is soon, and that's what we're preparing for here at this church. And I know that you're preparing for that in your own personal walk with the Lord. And uh, we can't wait uh, where there's no more separation between us and our loved ones. So um, anyways, I'm, in, I'm excited to share a message with you this morning. And it's a familiar parable that many of you are very familiar with. Uh, but we're going to pray that God will give us fresh eyes to take a fresh look at it here this morning. So if you, ha- uh, if you could, bow your heads with me uh, for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you so much, Lord, for this holy Sabbath day. We want to thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we have as believers, Lord, to come and worship you in freedom and to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, we ask, Lord, for your spirit to be here with us today, Lord, that you would speak to us from your word. I pray that you would speak through me as well, Father, that you would use me and and that each person here, Lord, would truly have a deeper understanding of your word and of the plan that you have for our lives, Lord. Bless each one, Lord. Draw us near, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you like to garden? Okay, wow, quite a few of you. That's awesome. How many, how many of you have never gardened a day in your life? Okay, there's a couple. Uh, far more that have gardened than not. Growing up in Nebraska, <clears throat> when I tell people I'm from Nebraska, oftentimes people think that I'm a farmer. <laughs> But I never grew up on a farm and never had that opportunity to really learn that much. Even growing up in the city, unfortunately, we never had a garden. So I never had a garden until I got married to my beautiful wife, Kristen. And immediately we began to garden in Federal Way in our uh, third floor apartment. (laughs) We built a garden box. It was about six feet wide and about, uh, or six feet long and then three feet wide that we put out on on our balcony. And uh, we tried to have a successful garden that year. We had a few things that grew, but not, not a bumper crop for sure. So I've learned a lot about gardening over the last couple of years. Last year, we actually got pretty ambitious, and we decided with COVID and everything, maybe we should have a big garden since, uh, you know, there were some shortages on a few things like toilet paper and other things that may have been short on. And, uh, and so we decided to, to have a garden. And... Um, we did a 15 by 40 foot plot and we planted it about a week before our, our baby was born and things got really busy. <laughs> things got really busy after our baby was born and we tried, uh, we tried to keep up with that, but uh, the weeds have a way of taking over sometimes, don't they? And uh, anyways, it was an adventure, but I've discovered a few things, learned a few things about gardening over the last couple years. I'm still a work in progress and learning a lot. M- many of you could teach me a lot, I'm sure about gardening since I'm a newbie, but I know that you need a few things to have a good garden. First, you need water, right? They have to have water to survive. Plants have to have water. You need good sunshine, and uh, you need to make sure that it's in good soil, that the plant that you're planting matches up with that kind of soil that has the right nutrients so that it can grow and thrive in that kind of environment. Now, there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from gardening, and in fact, Jesus drew out many principles uh, and teachings from of the agricultural cycle. And so uh, today we're actually going to take a look at another parable that Christ taught us. Last week we looked at which parable? Parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And, uh, and we're going to take a look at the parable of the sower here today. So if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And verses 1 through 9. 
The parable of the sower could also be renamed to the parable of the soils, because really there's a strong emphasis on the soil types, and that's where we're going to take a look here this morning. So Matthew chapter 13, verse 1, you're welcome to follow along in your Bible. I'll also put the verse there on the screen, so if you're there, let me know by saying amen. All right, Matthew chapter 13 and verse 1, the Word of God says, On the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got in the boat and sat, and the whole multitudes stood on the shore. Can you imagine being there for just a moment? I would just love to be like a fly on the wall, so to speak, right? To be able to just listen to Jesus as he's there beside the beautiful Sea of Galilee and as he's there speaking to the people. It would just be a real treat to be able to sit there at his feet. And notice what it says there in verse 3. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. Now, of course, farmers who sow crops and plant crops, they don't usually plant crops indoors unless they're planting in a greenhouse, right? Uh, Sometimes they'll start start them there and and, uh, it's a little bit warmer and, and all that. Well, back in Bible times, farmers dwelt in the towns and the villages and they stayed in there for, uh, for security and safety. Uh, and in the morning time, when it was time to go out to the fields, they would go out uh, and leave the, the village and go out to the fields where they would work. At the evening, they would return home from the fields. And uh, that'll become a little bit more connected as we continue on here, um, looking at um, who the sower represents. Let's look at verse 4 here. If my clicker will work. Let's go to this one here, guys. Thank you. All right, verse 4, Matthew chapter 13 and verse 4, And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. So back in those days, farmers scattered seed broadcast style, so they would take a, they, they would have a bag of seed, and they would be throwing the seed out and uh, trying to plant it in areas that they had plowed. Um, but sometimes the seed would fall along the path, and there was usually a path that would go on the outside of the garden, and then there were paths that sometimes went through the garden, just like you would uh, do that for your garden today, where you can get access to your plants that are growing. The seed that would fall on this hard ground would often be eaten up by the birds, um, and uh, that's what happened to this seed that fell by the wayside. Let's take a look here at verse 5. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Now, conditions for farming in many places of Israel were not uh, too favorable. Uh, It's quite a rocky terrain. Uh, There are some places where it's great, and other places where there's just tons and tons of rocks. In many places, uh, it was uneven, and there was only thin layers of dirt uh, covering uh, the rock below. So seed that landed on this shallow soil, it would germinate more quickly uh, than the seed that was sown in the deep soil, but it would also, uh, it couldn't put down deep roots, and, um, and so it would wither and then die with the hot sun. So that's the third type of soil, and then, or the second type, And then number seven, verse seven, and some seed fell among thorns and the thorns sprang up and choked them. So here we see that the thorns battled for the nutrition against the good seed, the good crops. And we see, we experience this in our gardens from year to year, right? That the weeds are trying to grow everywhere and they seem to magically appear in every place you don't want them, right? Now notice that in the first three scenes, there has been a progression here. First, the seed that fell by the wayside, it never germinated, it never grew. Instead, the birds just ate it up. Second, the seed fell in the stony ground and it grew quickly. So it grew quickly, but it didn't survive because there was no depth to that soil. There was no continued nourishment. And then third, we see that the seed fell into thorny soils, Uh, which survived for a while, but eventually got choked out by the weeds. And fourth, we'll talk about the good soil here in verse 8. So Matthew chapter 13 and verse 8, but other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So the good soil gave the seed a good place to grow. It was a good environment for it, and it was clearly blessed by God. But what makes good ground good? Well, Um, There are many things, right? You want to have the right soil type. You want to have the right uh, um, 
nutrition and everything there in the soil, so that way it can produce good crops. But Jesus is talking more, he's talking about something more than just uh, agriculture here. In verse 9, he says, he who has ears, let him hear. He's talking to a bunch of people that know a lot about agriculture, right? So he's actually talking much more than just agriculture. He's using a common illustration to, to teach deep spiritual truth here. So let's take a look at this. Uh, this alerts everyone uh, listening to Jesus that there's a deeper meaning that meets the eye. And uh, we know that spiritual things are spiritually discerned, right? And that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Now, some of you might be thinking, Pastor, I already know this parable. I grew up hearing about this parable, parable but I, I pray that God will help us to have fresh eyes as we take a look at it here this morning. It's good to be able to study familiar passages over and over again because God speaks to us in different ways at different times. Amen? And a passage that you've looked at a million times, you might read again tomorrow and find out, whoa, I never noticed that before. And, uh, and, and God has a way of teaching us truth when we're ready to receive it as well. Amen? We may not always like the truth at first. Uh, it may be difficult to implement sometimes into our lifestyle, but we don't follow Christ because it's easy. Amen? We don't follow Christ because it's convenient. We follow Christ because he's our Lord and Savior. Amen? We follow him because he's the way, the truth, and the life. And as we journey in this life with Jesus, it's appropriate for us at times to analyze our spiritual walk and to uh, examine our spiritual life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, we're encouraged to examine yourselves uh, as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. So we should examine ourselves spiritually to see where we're at, to see where we're at in our walk with the Lord, and whether we're living by faith or whether we're living for ourselves. Because Christ wants to daily commune with us, doesn't he? He wants to have a personal relationship with us each and every day. But what kind of soil do we have in our hearts? He's wanting to scatter the seed of truth into our hearts, but what kind of soil do we have? That's what we're going to take a look at here this morning. So let's continue on here in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 18. Jesus goes on to explain this parable. Verse 18, therefore hear the parable of the sower. Verse 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, what is the word of the kingdom? It would be the word of God, right? It would be the word of God. Uh, we see in Luke chapter 8 and verse 11 that uh, Luke makes it really clear. He says the seed is the word of God, right? And then um, we know who the sower is. Who would that be? Jesus Christ, that's right. And remember how the sower went out to sow? Just as the sower went out to sow, so Jesus left his home, right? He left his home. He left his home of heaven where he had the adoration of the angels 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands stood before him uh, around the throne and worshiped him. But he left all that to come to this earth for us and to teach the truth. Notice what Jesus said in John 18, verse 37. He said, For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to what? The truth. There were a lot of lies that were spread about God in heaven, and a lot of lies that were spread here on this earth after the fall, right? And so Jesus came to set the record straight by planting good seed, by planting the seeds of truth. So back to Matthew chapter 13 and verse 19, Jesus says, So when anyone hears the word of God or the word uh, of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. So these wayside hearers or those that receive seed on the beaten path, the walking path, are inattentive hearers. Uh, many have hardened hearts, and hearts that have been hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, the Bible talks about, were hardened by sin. They've been absorbed in selfishness and in sinful indulgences, and their spiritual faculties are paralyzed to the point that they hear the word, but they often don't understand it. And if they do understand it, sometimes they think that it doesn't apply to them. It applies to other people, right? I wish so-and-so would read this passage. They could benefit from it not realizing that God wants to speak to them through that passage as well. So Christ's message of grace doesn't concern these wayside hearers. And it's no doubt that some in the crowd that day that were listening to Jesus fell into this category. There was all different types of people there. 
and uh, many had hardened hearts, and this prevented the truth from sinking deep into their lives. Thus Satan, the wicked one, uh, comes and snatches what was sown in their hearts. He and his angels represent the birds that come and snatch up the seed that falls by the wayside. And this didn't just happen in Jesus' day. This happens in our day today as well, right? Satan comes and tries to steal uh, what the, the seed that falls by the wayside. People hear the word of God preached, yet it, because it doesn't meet their preconceived ideas, they often reject the message that God is trying to send them. And they don't perceive the love of Christ. So that's the hard-hearted wayside hearers. But what about the stony soil hearers? Let's take a look at them here. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 20. But he who receives the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. That's a good thing, right? We want to be able to immediately receive the word with joy. That's what God desires. But it says there in verse 21, yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. So there are, these are people that profess to be religious. They hear God's word. They immediately receive it with joy, which is what God wants. But the problem with this group is that they don't, cost, they don't count the true cost of discipleship. They don't count the cost of what, it, what the word of God really requires of them. And their love of self is not subdued. I like how the book Christ's Object Lessons, a beautiful book that talks all about the parables of Christ, it's, uh, it describes this in a very powerful way, I think. It says, The roots of the plants strike down deep into the soil, and hidden from sight nourish the life of the plants. So with the Christian, it is by the invisible union of the soul with Christ, through faith, that the spiritual life is nourished. It's by that union with Christ. That's how we are nourished in our walk with God. We have to keep that union strong each and every day so that we can be well nourished. But the stony ground here is depend upon who? Self instead of Christ. They depend upon self instead of Christ. They trust in their good works and good impulses and are strong in their own righteousness. They are not strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Such a one hath not root in himself for he is not connected with Christ. So stony ground hearers, they uh, depend not upon Christ, but they depend upon themselves and their own righteousness. They have the mentality that I can do this on my own. But what does the Bible say? Without me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. So we have to realize that as Christians. So instead, the stony ground here is they ought to surrender all to Jesus and rely upon him and his power to overcome and allow Jesus to remove the stones of selfishness in their lives. The sad reality is that the stony ground here is only endure for a little while. While life goes smoothly for them, they appear to be a consistent, faithful Christian, but when life gets tricky, when life gets hard, when they go through things that are challenging, um, and persecution arises, they are out of here. They are out of here. As many of you know, I've done a lot of door-to-door -door work in my lifetime, knocked on thousands and thousands of doors, and I've, uh, you know, had good experiences and bad experiences. I remember my very first door that I ever went to, I nearly, I was so nervous, I nearly forgot my name. That's how uh, bad it was at first, but I quickly realized that God had divine appointments in store for me each and every day. I would pray and I would see God bring people at home at just the right time. People would be pulling in. There were so many awesome experiences of times like that. But there were also a few people that weren't too happy sometimes, right? And, uh, you know, one of my canvassing leaders, uh, his name was Nelson, he, he called this rejection therapy. <laughs> Going door to door, he called it rejection therapy. And I think I think it's right. It keeps you humble at times, right? When someone rejects you, you have to realize they're not rejecting you, right? Jesus said if they persecute you in one city, you've got to shake off the dust and move on to the next one. God has people that are out there for each one of us. And um, so I think that's good. I think it keeps us humble, keeps us relying upon God. We're going to be going door to door in a couple of weeks, so that's my plug for evangelism here in a couple of weeks. I want to encourage you guys to come out, step out in faith, trust God. It'll be awesome. So we'll do that second Sabbath in April, right? 
So at, at some point in the future, we know that we will all face persecution, right? The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 123, not 123, but 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2, or 12, <laughs> wow, it says, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will what? Suffer persecution. How many of you like to suffer persecution? None of us, right? None of us. It's not a pleasant thing, but I believe that God will give us the strength to be able to endure whatever suffering that you and I have to experience in this life. He's wanting to build our faith to be able to stand. Maybe some of you have suffered in the past. Maybe some of you are suffering now. Maybe people in your family aren't favorable towards what you're doing, coming to church or uh, maybe your workplace. Maybe some of you have lost jobs for taking a stand for God and, and keeping the Bible Sabbath. We've all faced different kinds of persecution in our life, but God will bless you as you step out in faith for him. Christ is calling us to trust in him now, to dig deep into his word and to claim his promises. And that's why we're memorizing scripture together as a church family. That way, when the going gets rough, we will stay connected to God. We will be encouraged by his promises. But sadly, for these stony ground hearers, when the word of God points out some cherished sin in their life or requires uh, self-denial or sacrifice, they are often offended. They're often offended. Why? Because it would cost them too much to make a radical change in their life. It would cost them too much. They might lose their job. Family members might look down upon them. They might be criticized. But friends, when the word of God points out something in our hearts that we need to change, we need to just say, all to Jesus, I surrender. Amen? All to Jesus, all to him, I freely give. You got to surrender it all to him each and every day. But the stony ground here is they look at the present inconvenience, they look at the, the trial that they're going through, and they forget eternal realities. Like the disciples who left Jesus, they are ready to say, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? And just six verses later after this is John 6, 6, 6, which is the verse that says that at that time, many disciples left and walked no more with Jesus. And that's the case with many stony ground here is when the going gets rough, they bail no more to walk with Christ. But there's hope, amen? The only hope for these souls is to realize in themselves the truth of Christ's word to Nicodemus. Ye must be born again. Except a man be born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And friends, that is the only hope for the stony ground here is, and it's the only hope for us, amen? is to be born again and to submit to Jesus each and every day. It continues, true holiness is wholeness in the service of God. This is the condition of true Christian living. Christ asks for an unreserved consecration, for undivided service. He demands the heart, the mind, the soul, the strength, and self is not to be cherished. He who lives to himself is not a what? A Christian. He who lives to himself is not a Christian. That's a hard statement, isn't it? That's a strong statement. And that's why we need God to put, pour his love into our hearts, amen? Because naturally we're selfish, right? Naturally we're very selfish. Love must be the principle of action. Love is the underlying principle of God's government in heaven and earth, and it must be the foundation of the Christian's character. This alone can make and keep him steadfast. This alone can enable him to withstand trial and temptation. It's the love that God pours into your hearts, my friends. When we, and, and, and that love is poured into our hearts when we behold what Jesus did for us on the cross, right? The Bible says the goodness of God leads us to repentance. When we see that amazing love, it leads us to want to respond to him with open hearts and open arms. The quote continues, it says, and love will be revealed in sacrifice. The plan of redemption was laid in sacrifice, a sacrifice so broad and, and deep and high that it is immeasurable. Christ gave all for us, and those who receive Christ will be ready to sacrifice all for the sake of their Redeemer. The thought of his honor and glory will come before anything else. So praise the Lord, there is hope for the stony ground hearers. Amen? There's hope for each and every one of us when we surrender all to Jesus and we allow him to pour his love into our hearts. And we will be willing to give all to the one who gave all for us. So now, what about the third soil, the, 
the, the thorny ground soil. So let's continue here in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 22. Here Jesus says, Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. Now that word cares can also be translated worries. And so the worries of this world and the deceitfulness of, of riches can choke out the word of God. Now where do you often uh, find the, all the worries of the world? <laughs> when you watch the news, right? When you watch the news, you see all the worries of the world. This is what's happening. These are all the cares. These are all the concerns of everything that's happening locally, nationally, globally. And it can be and, you know, overwhelming, right? I don't know about you, but I can get overwhelmed where it's just like, I have to turn this off because it's overwhelming. But thankfully, God doesn't get overwhelmed. Amen? He knows everything that happens on this planet. He knows every tear that falls. And he's not overwhelmed because he's still in control. Amen? He's all-powerful and almighty and all-loving. And he wants to be there for each person on this planet. You know, Mark adds to this in his gospel. In Mark chapter 4 and verse 19, the lust for other things. He adds that to this passage. Luke adds the pleasures of life in Luke 8, 14. These are things that choke the word of God out of our lives. Instead of taking our burdens, instead of taking our cares and concerns and worries to Jesus, oftentimes we hold on to them, right? Kind of like Pilgrim and Pilgrim's Progress, we just kind of pile them on our, on our back and we're overwhelmed by the burdens that we carry. But the good news is that Jesus wants us to give those burdens to him. He says, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. That word care can be worries. Casting all your worries, casting all your burdens on him because he cares for you. So we must realize that God knows what's going on in our lives and he wants to give us grace. He wants to give us strength and to help in time of need. Sometimes the busyness of life, it crowds out the word of God in our lives to the point that we spend no time with the Lord. Sometimes that time is like non-existence. And the deceitfulness, is, the, the deceitfulness of riches can also choke out the, world, the word as well. And here in materialistic America, we all have struggled with the deceitfulness of riches. Riches claim to provide you with security and happiness and a life of ease. And it's not bad to have money. We talked about that last week, right? It's not bad to have money. It's not bad to be wealthy. It's the love of money that is bad. Amen? And we have to realize that everything that we have comes from God. Amen? It's all his anyways. We just want to be good stewards. Amen? Be faithful. The problem is when we put our trust in riches instead of putting our trust in God. And I think that's why uh, one of the nice things we have in America here is we have those little dollar bills and stuff. And what does it say on there? In God we trust. And I think that's just wonderful that that's still on there. Amen? It's wonderful because it's a good reminder every time we whip out a dollar or um, any kind of money that we need to put our trust in God, not in this money. This money could be worth nothing tomorrow, right? We have to put our trust in what really counts and, and, and the one who is altogether trustworthy. God will never fail us. Yes, you may experience difficulties and heartaches in this life, but God will not abandon you. Amen? Mark says the lust for other things. He adds this in uh, when he's talking about the parable of the sower and how lust for other things crowd out the word of God. Now, these are not necessarily uh, things that are sinful in and of themselves, but anything that we put first above God becomes an idol. Anything that we put above God first becomes an idol. That's a problem. Our top priority at this time should be to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to us. Luke then adds the pleasure, the pleasures of life. Now, it's not wrong to do things that bring, bring you pleasure. Amen? There are many wonderful things that, that God has given to us to bring us pleasure. Uh, for instance, holding your your newborn baby or holding your child or your grandbaby, that can bring you pleasure, right? That brings you joy and happiness. And that's something that God ordained and God designed. Um, spending time with your family can bring you happiness and joy. Uh, but the danger lies when pleasure becomes the great object of life. When pleasure becomes a great object of life. Often people bounce from one pleasure-seeking thing to the next. 
with little thought of God. We live in an amusement-driven society where we are used to being constantly entertained, right? Constantly amused. If it's not one thing, it's the other. There are hundreds and thousands of channels to watch and billions of websites to visit. There's an endless supply of distractions, right? Satan has plenty of ways to keep us entertained with the pleasures of this world. But the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 4 that in the last days there will, people, there will be people that are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And friends, we don't want to fall into this ditch. Amen? We don't want to fall into this ditch. And if we feel like we've already fallen into the ditch, the good news is, is that God can pull us out. Amen? Jesus can pull us out and he can set our feet on the solid rock and we can continue to move forward in faith with him. And that may mean that we need to unplug from a few things. We may need to turn a few things off uh, so that way we can have more time for God, so that we can have more time for our families. And that's okay, amen? It's okay to disconnect. It's okay for not everyone to know everything that you're thinking every moment of the day, <laughs> amen? May God help us to love him more than anything and anyone else. So we've seen the challenges of the thorny soil, but what about the good soil? What is that all about? Because that's what we want to be, is good soil. So let's continue on here in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 23. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 23, it says, But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And Luke adds to this in his version of the gospel here in Luke chapter 8 and verse 15, and he says that, that they, uh, people hear the word of God and they keep it. They keep it. So they, they're not just hearers of the word, but they're doers of the word as well. And Satan can't take that away from them. I like what uh, theologian Craig Blom, uh, Bloomberg, or Blomberg here uh, says in his New American Commentary on the book of Matthew. He says the parable provides a sober reminder that even the most enthusiastic outward response to the gospel offers no guarantee that one is a true disciple. Only the tests of time, perseverance under difficult circumstances, the avoidance of the idolatries of wealth and anxiety over earthly concerns, and above all, the presence of appropriate fruit, which is consistent obedience to God's will, can prove a profession genuine. This goes along with what Jesus said in this same chapter here in Matthew chapter 13. He said, by their fruits, you will know them. So how do good ground hearers bear fruit? Well, they first must receive the word, right? They must receive the word just like the, the believers did in Thessalonica. Look at what it says here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. Paul writes to them, he says, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. So good ground here is receive this word, not as the word of men. It's not just, people didn't just come up with this. Daniel and John didn't just think of these beasts and all these different things that are in here. No, God inspired everything here from Genesis to Revelation, and it's all the word of God for us, friends, and we need to receive it as such. So good ground here is believe that God's word is truth, and they desire above all things to have an understanding of that truth. They pray daily, and they search for answers to their questions. They meditate upon his words, and they hide God's word in their hearts. They also receive the word of God, like the Bible Bereans in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, uh, it says, these, that is, those in Berea were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures, how often? Daily to find out whether these things were so. So they heard the word, they received the word, and they were ready to act upon the word right away. Amen. It wasn't just going in one ear and out the other, but it, they were acting upon it as the Lord convicted them. And that's what good ground hearers will do. And by God's grace and by his power, the good ground hearers will produce fruits in their lives. So what is the fruit that God wants to produce in this good soil? Well, it's consistent obedience to God's will. 
It's consistent, obedient to God's will when we love to do the things that please Jesus. And it's not to earn salvation because that's not possible. Amen? It's not possible for you to earn salvation. It's not possible for me to earn salvation. We can't do that. It's a free gift. But Jesus wants to produce the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. So God wants to help each one of us to become more loving, to become more kind, to have more true joy, and to have true peace, and to be more patient. I know that that's something I need more of, is to be more patient uh, with my children, and that's something that the Lord wants to help each of us with. God wants to help us to be faithful. He wants us to be meek. He wants us to exercise self-control in our lives and in our diet and in every aspect of our lives. God wants you to be part of that good soil so he can plant his word in your hearts. And like any good farmer, he's doing all that he can to remove the rocks and to remove the thorns out of your life. But we have to want it too, right? We have to genuinely want that. We have to cooperate with him and let him till up the soil of our hearts. Look at what the Bible tells us in our scripture reading here, Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12. It says, sow, to your, sow for yourselves righteousness. In other words, do the things that you know please the Lord. Okay, do what you know pleases the Lord. Reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground. That is your rough soil. You can't do that on your own. You need Jesus to come as, with his rototiller and do that for you, Amen. He needs to bring his tractor and plow up the rough soil of our hearts. And we have to cooperate with him in that, my friends. So break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. Now is the time for us to seek the Lord. Now is the time to be grounding ourselves in the word of God. Now, before things get too much worse. Yes, COVID has been bad over the last year, right? Uh, we've had isolation. We haven't been able to do life quite as normal, and that has been unfortunate. Um, but that's nothing. It's, it's nothing compared to what's coming. It's, it's truly nothing. Our priority right now should be seeking first the Lord with all of our hearts and asking him to daily cover us with his robe of righteousness. Christ's Object Lesson says in page 56, here it says, as we kind of wrap things up here, throughout the parable of the sower, Christ represents the different results of the sowing as depending upon the soil. In every case, the sower and the seed are the same. So the sower is the same, Jesus is the same, right? The word of God is the same. Uh, thus, he teaches that if the word of God fails of accomplishing its work in our hearts and lives, the reason is to be found in where? Ourselves, but the result is not beyond our control. True, we cannot change ourselves, right? We cannot, like a leopard cannot change his spots. We cannot change ourselves, but the power of choice is ours, and it rests with us to determine what we will become. The wayside, the stony ground, the thorny ground hearers need not remain such. The Spirit of God is ever seeking to break the spell of infatuation that holds men absorbed in worldly things and to awaken a desire for the imperishable treasure. So the Spirit of God is seeking constantly to get our attention, right? To wake us up, to help us to see the importance of eternal realities. It is by resisting the Spirit that men become inattentive to or neglectful of God's Word. They are themselves responsible for the hardness of heart that prevents the good seed from taking root and for the evil growths that check its development. The garden of the heart must be cultivated. The soil must be broken up by deep repentance for sin. And repentance is not something that we can just muster up, right? The Bible says it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Continues on here, it says, just two more paragraphs here. It says, poisonous, satanic plants must be uprooted. Just like you need to go out and you need to uh, weed your garden, there are satanic plants plants that must be uprooted in our hearts. The soil once overgrown by thorns can be reclaimed only by diligent labor. 
If you don't go out and weed your garden, they will take over, right? <laughs> That's just the bottom line. Uh, it takes diligent effort, diligent labor. So the evil tendencies of the natural heart can be overcome only by earnest effort in the name and strength of Jesus. The Lord bids us by his prophet, break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. This work he desires to accomplish for us. He desires to accomplish this for us, and he asks for us to cooperate with him. So my question in closing here this morning is, how many of you want God to accomplish this work of breaking up the fallow ground in your heart? Is that your desire here this morning? And my second question is, is how many of you are willing to let him do that? How many of you are willing to cooperate with him? Amen? Amen. Let's pray together here as we close. Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you so much for the parable of the sower and the parable of the four soils here that we've taken a look at here this morning. And Father, we might, we might find ourselves in one of these four categories of soil right now, Lord. Maybe there's rocks in our soil. Maybe there's thorns that are choking out the word of God in our lives. And Father, I pray that you would give us wisdom, Lord, to know what to do, Lord. Maybe there's something that needs to be pulled out of our lives, something that needs to be cut off so that we can focus entirely on the things of heaven. Father, I want to pray for each one of us here today. Lord, we don't want to live for self. We want to live for him who died for us and who loves us with an infinite love. And so, Father, I pray for each person here today. Lord, I pray that you would bring your divine tractor, your rototiller, and that you would till up our hearts, dear God, and that you would help our hearts to be good soil for you, Lord, good soil for the word of God to grow and to mature and to develop, Lord, so that we can be sealed for the last days. And so, Father, I pray that you would Bless each one of us, Lord, as we seek to hide your word in our heart, as we seek to study. Lord, help us to be like the Bible Bereans and to search the scriptures daily, Lord, and to really understand what we believe and why we believe it. Bless each one here today, Father. I pray that you would help us, Lord, to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, uh, the divine gardener, Lord, who wants to cultivate the soil of our heart, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that you love us, that you have a desire, Lord, to put your word in our hearts, Lord. Bless each one. May we be found faithful, Lord, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.